This is an emergency podcast system episode of Rumble with Michael Moore. I am Michael Moore, and I welcome all of you to this special edition. We have no time to waste, my friends. This this takeover, this police state that Donald Trump and Attorney General William Barr are attempting to accomplish. It's the first steps of what they perceive to be their coup that's going to keep them at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, regardless of whether there's an election or not, regardless of the results of the election or whatever. They have sent in federal troops. They have sent in combat troops. They have invaded not another country, but Portland, Oregon. And not just Portland. They've now sent troops to Chicago, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they have announced that they plan to send them to Baltimore, Detroit, New York, regardless whether the mayors of these cities want them there or not, regardless whether the governors want them or not. These special agents, these secret police, they show up in either all black uniforms with no insignias, no names, no badge numbers. They show up in army fatigues and camouflage, full camouflage, fully weaponized, ready to do battle, ready to take lives, ready to defeat the enemy. And the enemy is us. We are Trump's enemy. There's a lot of things he doesn't get, but he's got that one right. He knows it. He knows his chances of actually winning in November are slimmer and slimmer each day. He already lost the popular vote once four years ago. He'll lose it by even more this time around. He knows that. They've got the data. But he's not going anywhere. He will first try to suppress the vote. That's what the Republicans are good at. And when he sees that that's probably not going to work, he'll create a, a fake crisis in the hopes that he can postpone the election. He'll have one trick up his sleeve after another. He will not go. And he's started the war now. The war. He says he's a war president. This is a war, he says, that he's in. First, he was in a war against the coronavirus and and horribly lost that war. So now he's in a war against what he calls the radical left, the anarchists. All those, all those people out there in the streets. That is how he has filtered through this most historic moment in our country's history that the large, what's been called the largest political protest movement now for the past almost two months since the murder of George Floyd. Hundreds upon hundreds of cities holding marches, holding protests out in support of Black Lives Matter. He sees the writing on the wall. He's not happy with it. And so he wants to set an example And so he sent these secret police. We don't know who they are, what they are, where they're from. He sent them to Portland, Oregon. Because the protests there have been intense. For well over 50 days now. Non-stop protesting in Portland. And he decided that that has to stop. Because if, if Portland gets away with it. It's not just Portland, by the way. Dozens of cities continue to protest every single day. He needs to put an end to this. He needs to show his base how strong he is, how he will crush dissent. And so if he can make an example of Portland, if he can threaten the rest of the country and show them, see, this is what I did in Portland. You want me to do that to your city too? He thinks that is how he's going to stop the dissent. And he couldn't be more wrong. Because there's one thing I know about Portland from my limited time there. This is 
this is a city that won't give up, won't back down, won't silence themselves. You really need to choose your battlefield. Trump, you've picked the wrong city. It's been pretty bloody there. You've seen the pictures. I decided we needed an emergency podcast today, and not just today, actually. I'm going to give voice to the people in Portland over these next few days. We will have a series of emergency podcast reports from Portland. Portland, trying to create a police state in Portland. I hope that you tell others about this podcast over these next few days. Let them know how they can listen in. You will hear from people in Portland who are on the front lines. You'll hear the truth about what Trump's troops are really doing. I'm so upset about this, my friends. I know that this is the beginning of the end for Trump, but to him, it's the beginning of the end of our democracy. Who will win this battle? We can't lose. We can't afford to lose. So many people have been arrested. So many people have been shot, abused. Awful. Blood in the streets across the United States of America. And when Trump issued his executive order last month saying that he was going to make sure that anybody who tore down a Confederate statue, that they would be arrested, prosecuted, and sent to prison for 10 years for tearing down the statue of someone who killed Americans to keep slavery legal. This is what he's defending. And he's expanded it to include any any defacing of federal property. And they're serious. They have been arresting people. I happen to believe it's a First Amendment right to protest and to protest in ways that do not harm other people. And sometimes that means taking the head off Christopher Columbus. Not the real Christopher Columbus. I'm opposed to any kind of beheading of people. But he's been gone for quite some time. He did his damage to the native people here. I'm not going to encourage anybody to break the law. That's a choice you have to make. Or to deface or destroy property that is honoring uh, traitors and bigots. But I don't want you to suffer either. So uh, today I'm establishing uh, the Rumble Legal Defense Fund for American Dissidents. And specifically focused on those of you who have been arrested for trying to tear down one of these racist statues. For those of you who have defaced property uh, in the name of justice and anti-racism. Uh, I want you to know that you've got somebody that's going to be there for you when you have to pay the price. Because you did this knowing the price you'd have to pay. And as if you know anything about the history of civil disobedience, it means paying a price. Well, I want to help you pay that price. I don't want you to have to, to worry about things like lawyers or lawsuits. For those of you who've been injured by the police and need to sue them or the government for what they've done to you, uh, I want this fund to be there for you too. So I will uh, have the uh, link where you can click on to the Rumble Defense Fund. This money is going to go 100%. No administration fees, no nothing. 100% to lawyers and groups and others who are there to help the people that Trump's goons are arresting, are jailing, are threatening with 10 years of imprisonment. And I want to invite all of you to donate uh, to this fund. It's, a, it's a, going to be a modest fund at the beginning here, $50,000. So I'll put some in, you put some in. Let's raise this money quickly. Let's not have any, anybody spend more than a night in jail because they took the risk in the name of the rest of us, the rest of us who can't take the risk because we're quarantined because of the pandemic, can't take the risk for a variety of reasons or maybe just don't want to. That's okay too. But we have some brave young people that have been taking that risk and we need to support them. So I ask you to support the Rumble Defense Fund for American Dissidents. Just go to the link here on the homepage here of the podcast, whatever platform you're listening to it on. Uh, I'll also have it on my Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. Uh, so please support uh, this uh, legal defense fund for the people who are having to uh, go through the torment that they're going through right now because they took a stand for the rest of us. And now I want to begin 
right away. We need to get right to this, to our first guest. This will be our, our first pod, our first episode here of this uh, a few days, a series of uh, emergency podcast episodes uh, dealing with the Trump police state as it begins to try to take shape in the form of suppressing dissent in the city of Portland, Oregon. And so let's get busy right now. We'll be back again tomorrow with part two and uh, the day after that. So um, stick with me here, folks. We cannot turn our heads to this. We cannot, we cannot remain silent. And we must listen to the people on the front lines right now in Portland. And that's what I'm going to bring to you over the next few days. Please tell your friends and family um, about these emergency podcast episodes of Rumble. And let's get started right now. So for the past uh, 56 nights or so, pretty much um, every night or every other night, um, our guest, our first guest here uh, on this emergency podcast uh, is a young man, 17-year-old a student. Uh, his name is Garrison Davis from Portland, Oregon. He has been uh, pretty much for most of these nights, every night out there, in the middle of the protest that started immediately after the murder of George Floyd and have continued uh, ever since and now have been reinvigorated, if that's a word, by the appearance of Trump's shock troops, the secret police uh, that uh, he has sent in uh, to Portland. I welcome you, Garrison. Thank you very much uh, for being on Rumble. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. And And thank you for you know, risking your life in a sense uh, out there night after night uh, recording what's going on. I think one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is, is that I believe you are the first person and you're, and let me just also say that you are now a, a student at the Northwest Film Center Film School in Portland. So you are also now a filmmaker, but you, I think were the first to capture troops with no identification no idea who they were, where they were from, other than that they were dressed uh, as if they were just dropped into Fallujah, uh, into into some kind of battle that where they were, where troops that are dressed like that are dressed, they are, they don't shoot to maim, they shoot to kill. So pretty scary sight. You were there. Tell I mean, take us right back to the first moment that you noticed their presence. This is before any of us knew about it, and you captured that. and And tell us the whole story of how that happened. Yeah. So we, we first started seeing kind of these troops in this like camo fatigue in very early July. It, it started with just like a dozen or so kind of, we can see them inside the courthouse. They would occasionally kind of um like r- run out if someone was like banging on a door or something. Uh, but it started just as like a very small presence. And we didn't even know they were like, like sent in at that point. We just thought it was, it, it could have been like some section of the Portland Police Bureau or something like we 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 didn't really know who who they were for for like about a week. Um, on July fourth, they were assisting the Portland Police Bureau in um uh, in pushing away people from from the courthouse because uh, the uh, the protesters kind of set up their own fireworks show, launching fireworks both up into the air and then also like towards some government buildings, uh, but like you know made out of concrete. So th- that was like really the first night that they were there in like um a large presence and then ever since after july 4th portland police bureau has almost completely pulled back and it's been just these secret police sending tear gas into city parks uh marching through uh portland streets blocks and blocks away from any federal property and pulling over and taking people into vans uh, without telling them who they are what their charges are if they're even arrested why they're being taken um pulling you know like putting blindfolds over their eyes as they are in this vehicle with these, with these officers just driving around in the city. So Trump had announced at the beginning of uh, July, he was going to go after anybody who tried to tear down a statue, a Confederate statue or graffiti. All of a sudden this was um, some federal offense that he was going to enforce and, and jail imprison anybody up to 10 years who um, did anything to 
harm federal property. And he wasn't, this is one of these fake executive orders that he likes yeah. to sign with his big, uh, his, his big Sharpie. The, 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 he actually started to do it. He started to send these troops, but, but we first heard about it from you, essentially you, a 17 year old. Yeah. What, how did, how, when you first, the very first stuff you started filming, I mean, what was going through your head? And then, and then when did it dawn on you that maybe you should let the rest of us see this, what's going on in Portland? I mean, I, I've been trying to get people to see what's going on in Portland ever since May, because the, uh, the Portland Police Bureau is number one in police brutality than any other police department in for the past like 60 days. So, I mean, there's been a lot of people here in Portland trying to really get the word out, but just because there was so much stuff going on, especially in Seattle, that really kind of stole the spotlight with the, um, with the chop. But yeah, when, when the Seattle stuff kind of died down and then federal stuff in Portland picked up, that's when, you know, everyone, that's when the national spotlight kind of moved over. But I mean, I, I had been filming, I'd been filming the federal officers shooting people in the head, uh, sending tear gas into parks, taking people into vans for like, over a week and a half before before stuff uh, really before stuff really got out there. I mean, I sent some stuff to the local news stations. They they were playing it, and then I think um, someone from the local NBC affiliate um, asked me if they would if they could send some of my footage to the national NBC. And that's when stuff really started picking up for like me personally, with you know talking to talking to different people, different news organizations, you know, requesting footage, interviews, all all that kind of stuff. So I think I saw your footage before I knew who you were. Uh, and this is a pre secret police, um, because I think I, that footage and I, people can go on your Twitter site. Uh, your handle is at hungry bow tie, just as it's spelled hungry bow tie and, and see this amazing, uh, and disgusting footage, especially the one you just the mentioned there of that, the, the young person who I think he was just holding up, a. A boom box. A boom box. Yeah, I was going to say a boom box uh, a la John Cusack, 1989 in Say Anything, holding it up above his head. And they obviously, they took aim directly at him and hit him uh, in the middle of his forehead. Yeah. Fractured his skull, knocked him out, and and blood everywhere. In fact, you even warn people before you watch this, uh, this is going to be pretty bloody. Yeah, but so so I did see that. I saw that, and then we're talking about this is back in, geez, when was that? Um, that was July 11th. July 11th. So this is a, and and what is the day? The what's the date? The day that you that we really saw um, these uh, these camouflage troops, secret police uh, emerge in full force into the into the streets. Y- yeah. So um, July 11th was when that happened. At around July 14th through 16th, that's when we started seeing people getting taken in the vans. Okay. Um, We've seen that footage, right? Where protesters are just kind of swept off the sidewalk and thrown into yeah. the back of a minivan yeah. or some or other one of those black SUVs. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's It's been found out by some local reporting here that those are just like rental cars. Like they're not even like undercover government vehicles. They just rented those cars in Portland. And they're using them to take people, not not even protesters. There's some people taken that just happened to be wearing black clothing and downtown at the wrong time, and they were s- taken away in in these vehicles. The one you on uh, your footage, uh, the one guy was just he wasn't protesting or anything. He literally was just on a sidewalk all by himself, not with anybody else. And they just hauled out of the. I didn't know they were rented. Many okay, so these so this is our we're. No, <laughs> The greatest military force on earth going to budget budget rental car to get their to get their secret police vans. You see, I know we don't really mean to be laughing because this is actually very serious, but I'm I'm laughing only because it gives me hope that we will defeat them. Yes. We we will they will not win because they're idiots and and most of us aren't. And so yes, go ahead. So speaking to them kind of being idiots yeah one thing they keep doing is they keep putting up a fence around the courthouse and uh that that fence doesn't stay there for too long and eventually that fence is going to be used against them every single night that they put it out just today they unloaded tons of like concrete barriers and i'm like all right well 
in about 12 hours, those concrete barriers are going to be doing a very different job than what they're doing right now. Um, so th they just keep giving people materials to barricade different sections of the city, uh, barricade like the courthouse. Especially in Portland, you put out the concrete barricades within 12 hours. They're not only, only going to be used for something else. They'll also have some amazing modern art uh, yes. spray painted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> onto them. So you posted, I think uh, yesterday or on your, on your uh, uh, Twitter account, you were talking about how essentially teenagers were defeating federal agents. And you, and you have some footage there of a group of, I don't know, four or five teens wrestling one of these camouflage troops who's got the camouflage guy's got all these web, all this weaponry on him. Yeah. The teenagers have no weapons and they wrestle them to the ground. They're, they don't hit them. They don't strike them. They don't, as, as far as I could see in the video, yeah. they, they just, they just took them down. And then you can hear one of them say, okay, it, it was like they, they take it down a Confederate flag. Okay, let's go. And then they're, and then they're out of there. They don't want to hurt the guy. And he's very embarrassed. The cameras are on him. Your camera is on him. And you wrote something about, you well, You should say it in your own words. I can't remember exactly what it's now, but essentially that, that young people and young adults were up against uh, the, the mightiest force in the world and actually defeating them night after night. What, and anything they attempt to do, whether it's put up a fence or put up a barricade, it doesn't matter because the people of Portland aren't going to tolerate it. Yeah. Ever since like this past Friday, like after the federal officers first came and, you know, they shot the person in the head. They were, you know, taking people in vans. Everyone was really down and really feeling hopeless. Um, but the past, like, four nights, f f five nights now, have been, I, I would consider them, like, consecutive wins by the protesters. We we've had a group of teenagers in black hoodies and moms in yellow consistently beating the federal troops and sending them back into their little building. Um it, it, the, the thing you're talking about with the, with the wrestling, uh, a, a, f a few of my friends were actually the ones filming that. I was I was off to the side uh, getting shot at at the time. Uh, but I, I, I talked to them about that. What was happening is there was a, in, an officer um, uh, tackled someone and was trying to arrest them. And there were no other officers around. So these like four kids were like, you know what? We're not going to let our friend get arrested. And they, they, they jumped this guy. Um, and the person that was getting arrested... Uh, ran away um but but they they really only jumped him and like there, there was no one around they could have done a lot more to this officer he like he he had a sidearm on him. like he had he had like stuff could have been done to this guy and they're like no no we're just gonna save our friend and then we're gonna leave um but in the like like five seconds later we saw another another federal officer who like saw this guy on the ground ran over and he actually did pull his sidearm and pointed it at, at like at the crowd um and that's kind of thing a lot of the journalists here and a lot of the protesters are kind of bracing for is when a sidearm is actually going to get fired because that's really the that's really the only escalation we need to see now because at this point Portland is very resistant to tear gas very resistant to flashbangs um, we have a very there's a very good shield wall that is getting used every day you know kind of like in Hong Kong. Explain to the people listening that when you say that Portland is resistant uh, to tear gas and flash bombs. That that you all have figured out a way to not let the weapons uh, that we'll call them for right now mostly non lethal weapons sure uh, but they can be lethal yeah. um, uh, that they use against you they are not able to succeed in stopping the resistance uh, in Portland How, can you share I I I know you probably don't want to give away your trade secrets but can you just share this with all of us in these other cities to, uh, because we've noticed how they, they cannot seem to beat you back. And, um, and even you in your, on your Twitter page, uh, your name is listed as, you know, Gar Garrison Davis. And underneath that uh, it says in, in parentheses, uh, tear gas proof. And, and, and I, I, <clears throat> was just wondering, have you built up some sort of immunity to tear gas or what are the shields? How do you build these things? What do you bring along with you so that the tear gas and the flash bombs which are actually very loud and very dis, uh, discombobulating um, when they fire them to, to just tell us the, the method of this, because I got a feeling we're all going to need to know this in the 
next uh, four months uh, between now and the election? Yeah, so the reason why Portland's been getting so good at this is because for all of July, Portland police was brutal with tear gas. Um, and they actually got a federal restraining order from using tear gas because they used so much of it. And they're currently being sued by about every journalist and about every kind of like legal team because of just the amount of uh, just reckless use of crowd control munitions. Um, so so Port Port Portland had like a really good starter month. Um, and everything the feds are doing is just escalating what the police were doing. So we had we had like a month we had like we had a month of practice with the police and now that the feds are here everyone kind of has the basis of what to do and specifically the last week has been the most organized that I've seen. We've have we have like a group of 50 people uh with shields made out of either uh, like umbrellas, pieces of wood, trash can lids, plastic um like a you know like a barrels cut in half and they all move to the front line and so and they stop it because uh when tear gas is fired it's, it gets either can be thrown or it can be shot at it can be shot out of like a launcher so these shields can stop all of the launchers so if, if it hits the shield and bounces away that's not going to get behind it into the crowd now the how the shield people stay ungassed is either most of them probably have gas masks on and goggles but there's also a team of people with leaf blowers right behind them that blow any gas out of the shield wall. So the shield wall can keep moving forward into the gas and they're not going to be badly affected because there's all these leaf blowers pushing the gas away. Plus <laughs> everyone has gas masks on. Okay. Um, I love this. I love that. Eventually there would be a, a, an important, a, an important use to protect uh, our democracy or use for these leaf blowers. That's an amazing idea. Of course, it just blows it right back at the police. There was a, a, a statement made by, I think it was a journalist that talked to a DHS officer uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, the statement is, um, one DHS official we spoke to expressed frustration and astonishment that Portland protesters were showing up with leaf blowers to disperse tear gas and send it right back at the Fed agents. And yeah, wow. that's that's what we've been seeing um, every night here. So, Talk about recycling. That's just... <laughs> Just take the tear gas and send it back to where it came, and, so, yeah. and the mighty leaf, the mighty leaf blower becomes one of our most important uh, defense weapons in our arsenal. But I, I've seen everything from hockey sticks being used to like slap tear gas canisters back. I've seen like um lacrosse like nets used, and just people in like oven mitts and um, with like you know heat proof gloves just picking up canisters and chucking them back at the feds. Um, although whenever someone does that, they'll usually get shot at about probably 20 times with, r r with rubber bullets because the feds and the police really don't like when you throw the tear gas back at them. A every time that happens, um, that it's person, humili it's humiliating. Yeah. They, 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 they hate it and they hate it, they hate, yeah. and they hate it so much that they are going to shoot that person 10 times with, with rubber bullets, right. getting brutal right. bruises all over their body. Um, uh, but the person understands that they know the risk and they feel like they want to do that anyway, to either protect themselves, the crowd. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's a trade-off that they accept. Now, when they get hit, what protection are they taking for themselves with the rubber bullets? I mean, most people are just out here in like sweatpants and hoodies. I mean, that's, that's, that's really what we're seeing. Like I, I was shot with a wow. rubber bullet in the, in the leg last night. I have a pretty big bruise. I'm still limping. I, and I, I was even wearing my heavy duty pants. Uh, so that, you know, uh, people, some people have like, you know, full, full, like, full, like, a uh, you know, stuff in front of their face. Um, you know, a gas mask is good because, you know, it's going to stop gas. It's also going to, you know, make sure your cheek's not shot. I am now wearing a ballistic helmet um, and, and, and I have goggles. But yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of people with, you know, uh, head protection, eye protection, face protection, uh, you know, gloves. A f a f a some of like the press are wearing like bulletproof vests. I haven't seen as many on the protester side, though. You mentioned that these uh, these secret police, they're carrying these sidearms. Yeah. And what we've learned is, is that these individuals are not necessarily trained for combat, even though they're wearing combat uniforms. Uh, they, are, they are various sorts of federal officials. Some of them are customs. Most of them is border patrol. Yeah. War and border patrol. So they have not had a lot of what we'll call action over the years, and they are not uh, even just watching uh, the your teenage friends uh, kind of wrestle the guy away from the your friend that was being arrested. Um, you could see that he did not have any kind of 
wherewithal of knowing how to, um, you know, you said make an arrest, but I don't, are they actually arresting? Do they read anybody their rights? And, and I mean, them? they'll do, yeah, like they're gonna do that hours later, maybe if they're arrested. But a lot of what we're seeing is just a uh, temporary detainments. So just taking people off the street so that they're not protesting, but not actually charging them with anything. That's, that's what we're seeing a lot. But, 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 but we're also seeing people charge with federal felonies that, that, that has happened to a, 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 f- a fair number of people. Wow. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of this episode, um, I uh, personally, and um, in this podcast, we are sending, we are setting up a, a GoFundMe account uh, targeted especially and specifically for people who are arrested um, uh, for uh, so-called defacing of federal property or statues or whatever. And it's a, it'll be, it's a legal defense fund essentially to help uh, those who will need some kind of um, financial aid in defending themselves or getting out of jail or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So, and I'll, I'll, at the end of the podcast, I'll give people more information about um, how they can donate to it. 100% of the uh, funds will go to those who've been arrested uh, by these uh, federal agents. Um, so, but you mentioned they're carrying sidearms, which means they're carrying weapons with live ammunition. And I am so afraid every morning when I wake up, I, I think, uh, you know, because th- this goes on well into the night in Portland, past midnight, past 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Uh, you know, on the East Coast, we're asleep. And I just fear, I pick up my iPhone in the morning and I just, I, I think we're going to start, this was the night that these feds are actually going to kill innocent people. And you guys must be very worried about this uh, because it only takes one of those agents um, who feels that a bunch of teenagers and moms um, who, you know, I don't know how to say this. Well, I'll use their own quote. We wanted to dress like we were on our way to Target. <laughs> so, so uh, if they're t- if they end up killing one of those mothers, end up killing one of you, or your friends, we will not only be crushed by this. The level of anger. Um, I mean, people are already rising up against what they're seeing right now. It's taken a few days, I think, for everybody to kind of catch on to. Because you don't want to believe that we could actually become a real police state. You know, we, we might you say that rhetorically, but really, not really, right? And then now we look at Portland. Um, what are you? What are you doing either to protect yourselves or, or to deal with the very real possibility that these Trump troops um, may kill somebody or somebody's? Yeah, I mean, and the, so I've personally seen a side, sidearm be pulled twice. Uh, both in scenarios where no one's life was ever in danger. You know? um, but also, there is about a, a third of the officers that are out here are actually carrying, like, AR-15s. Like, there, there is there, people carrying assault rifles out in the streets of Portland. Um, that's like, it's, 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 it's not just people with riot control gear. There's, there is people with lots and lots of live, live ammo walking at the streets. And we see them, you know, train their guns at, at, at just random groups of people, like, as they're complying with orders or not orders, because actually the feds actually don't give orders. Only the police really gives orders. Um, p- people moving away from tear gas and they're, they still, you know, train, train these rifles on them. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that's something, you know, all of the protesters I uh, are thinking about kind of everyone in like the, like the indie press um, scene in Portland. That's something we're all talking about. I mean, we, we all have group chats that I mean, we, we, we're discussing, you know, how we're going to handle stuff when this happens. But I mean, every night when I go out now, I have to constantly be looking for, you know, where's some where's some cover that can actually like stop a bullet if stuff happens. You know, what's my what's my evacuation route? Uh, you know, what what am I going to like? How can I position myself to make sure I, like I'm not going to get like directly in the line of fire if there's if there's live ammo if if if, if there's live live ammo? Um, that's just something that's you know constantly on on my mind and. It's really weird to be in, in like an American city and to have that to be like your natural thought process, and you don't even like question. It. You're like, okay, yeah, no, this is something I actually have to like. This is something I actually have to like think about and consider, because that's that's kind of the place that we're in in Portland now. Is that these secret police have been here for so long, and they've tried everything they 
can to stop this and the protests have only gotten bigger and yeah and like you said as soon as one officer gets jumpy it, 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 it just takes one person to to get to get spooked and then he unloads live ammo on a kid and that's and that's a possibility now and that's something that we're trying to prepare for every every day this is uh it's very disconcerting uh to hear you uh describe this this possibility and um obviously if congress um or you know uh, i know there uh your senator out there uh merkley is um presenting a bill to to end this secret police business across the country but instead what happened yesterday, what Attorney General Barr and Donald Trump announced yesterday is that they're expanding what they've been doing in Portland. In recent weeks, there has been a radical movement to defund, dismantle, and dissolve our police departments. Extreme politicians have joined this anti-police crusade and relentlessly vilified our law enforcement heroes to Look at it from any standpoint, the effort to shut down policing in their own communities has led to a shocking explosion of shootings, killings, murders, and heinous crimes of violence. This bloodshed must end. This bloodshed will end. Today, I'm announcing a surge of federal law enforcement into American communities plagued by violent crime. We'll work every single day to restore public safety, protect our nation's children, and bring violent perpetrators to justice. We've been doing it, and you've been seeing what's happening all around the country. We've just started this process, and frankly, we have no choice but to get involved. Uh, The next two cities that are going to get the secret police are Chicago and Albuquerque. Weird. (laughs) You know, (laughs) a couple days ago, they said... They're going to add Baltimore. They're going to add Detroit. Uh, They mentioned New York, Uh, but they went, they, they, they are adding Albuquerque and, uh, and Chicago. I said this last week uh, that Portland is, is the dry run. Yeah. Portland is the, let's see if we can get away with this because if anybody knows anything about Portland and, and it's part of the DNA of Portland to protest, to have your voice heard, to uh, resist. And I, I, back in 2011, I was touring the country to visit and participate in different Occupy uh, sites. And Occupy Portland might have been one of the largest, certainly the most well-organized, I think, of most of the uh, Occupies that I visited around the country. Uh, they had taken over this large park in the middle of the city. I forget the name of it now, but it was an amazing site, Occupy Portland. So I've known personally over the years just um, that Portland is a city that will not remain silent in the face of injustice. That's that's just the MO. And it doesn't mean it's a perfect city. You, you've also seen stories of white supremacists and others, uh, in, in Portland. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not hate Ashbury in the sixties, but, um, I believed when this started a couple of weeks ago, that the, the point of this, um, was going to be, be to see if we could get away with this in Portland. If they, as you said, in the first days when they arrived, people started to feel hopeless, helpless. It's like, how are we ever going to fight this? We're going to yeah. lose, you know, that sense that comes off. They exactly what, what they want us to feel exactly the response they want. They want that response and they want somebody to start a riot. So to give them the justification to riot themselves. What we've been watching from Portland is they've, they have been the rioters, the secret police. Uh, and they just stepped in to fill the shoes of the Portland police who were already rioting since May 25th. So, yeah. so it, 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 do you agree with us that, that this is, that this was oh, yeah. like spring training 
Portland was the, this was, uh, uh, you know, what's the show on Broadway? It's in previews. Yes, it was the preview. Yeah, it was this was preview. absolutely. This was absolutely. This is absolutely like the test run of what Trump wanted to do, which is why it's so important that if if we don't want this to become a police state, that Portland succeeds in fighting off these people. Because yeah, the, the first few weeks everyone was hopeless, and that was that was the goal. I think a lot of the goal of all those you know like kidnappings in those vans and just the extreme brutality. On, uh, you know, on like the first few weeks, that was just to get people to not want to come out. That was to like brutalize them enough that they feel like they can't do anything and that they just should stop going out to protest. Um, and and that worked for about a week. But after a week, all of that fear turns into anger. And then when people are angry, they want to do something. And what they're going to do is they're going to go out in the streets and they're going to fight the feds. And that's what we've been seeing happen this this past weekend. And I, I think that's shocked them too. I think that they're they're stunned by what they've seen, the resistance, whether it's the kids, the teenagers, whether it's the moms, whether it's naked Athena. I don't know if people saw that over the weekend, but there was a woman who just went right up to the line of these secret uh, police and stood there butt naked in front of them and and almost daring them. And And if you watch the whole tape what's amazing is is how these men <laughs> do not know what to do <laughs> and i think a couple of them got out that got out their own iphones because they wanted oh, to they did a, they want yeah. to get a picture or a selfie they're supposed to be there you know tr- taking trying to take down the protesters but send one naked woman in and it was like uh oh this is different they don't know how to handle it. And you could see their brains trying to go, wait a minute. What's this? That woman doesn't have any clothes on. And then she she sat down in the street and started doing yoga poses. And and the final the final shot of of, of is is her sitting there, sitting on the street, facing them, staring them right down. And opening her legs, saying, this, here's my weapon. Here's my, tr- stop this. And they would just, they it worked and they, they left. left. They left. They ran away from, I don't know what to call it, but it's like, it's like, I don't, I, I think we're just really a, a few weeks away from the 100th anniversary of women <laughs> fighting for and demanding in, in uh, the vote. And here is this singular woman saying, I am more powerful than all of you. I don't care what, how many guns you have. And they were at the beginning, they, they were still trying to fire some, those little yeah. pepper balls of a uh, tear gas at her. She didn't flinch, not a flinch, you know? And yeah. then, and then <laughs> some well-meaning liberal guy, Got a, a, a makeshift shield to stand in front of her to protect her, and she shoot him away. Yeah, like, get out of here, dude. I'm a woman. I'm strong enough. It was mind blowing. I don't know. Were you there, uh, Garrison, for that? I was. I, I I was. I was there. I was there for the whole thing. Yep. Is that some of your footage that we might be watching? I don't know, but it was. It, what? Give us your impression of of what happened. And remember, you're only seventeen. Yes. Um. Yeah. So she she just walked up. Uh. Past all of you know the protesters, you know, in, with like with like shields and leaf floors, and they they were all behind her. She just marched past everybody, planted right in front of the feds, and just stared them down for ten minutes until the feds just didn't know what to do. They're like, "Well, um, I guess we could try shooting her more, but uh, there's a, there's there's a lot of cameras watching, and I really don't know what to do with myself." And then they all just left. Um, and yeah, and previously that street was that previously that street was getting tear gassed, and then she walked up, and then they stopped tear gassing the street. Um, so th- so that 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 happened, and then the very next day we had five hundred moms show up. So talking about yeah, like uh, like women being stronger than you know everyone else. The next day we got five hundred moms all show up to the front to the front lines and stare down the feds and just look disappointingly at all these officers as they tear gas them and their children. Um, and we saw a lot of very snarky signs. There, my, my favorite one was, I'm so disappointed in you, mom. Um, that was, that was one, one of my, one of my favorite signs of that night. 
Man, so now when the mom showed up, what was the reaction to that? What, I mean, what that must have also really flipped them out because I, I oh, yeah, because again, I've seen the footage here, so just describe that situation. Yeah, so the, the, uh, when the moms first showed up, there was you know, there was like singing and chanting, like there usually is, like in the early evening. And then when people wanted to get closer to the courthouse, these moms were like, all right, there's people at the courthouse. We're, we're going to go to the courthouse too. And they all like linked arms, all marched right in front of the fence because the, 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 there was a fence there at the time and stood right in front of the fence. Um, the officers all charged out and they looked at these moms. They stood around for like 15 minutes and they're like, I, I, I guess we could tear gas the moms at this point, but but may, maybe not. And then the moms just stared at them until they went back inside their building. Um, wow. And yeah, that was, that was a uh, last Saturday. Uh, and that's just, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. You see like 300 like mothers, everyone, you know, everyone from like their twenties to like their sixties, just standing in front. And most, uh, most of them at that point didn't did most of them didn't have any gas masks. They just had, you know, like the regular m medical masks for COVID. Um, and they're just, you know, standing in front of these officers with, you know, AR-15s, riot control gear, you know, like tear gas launchers. And they're just standing there like unflinching. Um, and officers like pace back and forth on the courthouse, not knowing what to do. How have the people of Portland kept up these protests for, I think it's, I, I don't have the number exactly right, but it's probably 55, 56 straight nights, days. almost yeah. 60 days since George Floyd. Uh, was murdered. How, because, you know, we've seen in the past, at first, there's always a big outpouring first day or two, maybe the first week, um, and then it goes away. And they, and those in, in authority always count on people getting burned out. Uh, they've got families, they've got jobs, they've got things to do. And, and the protests become smaller and smaller. How has this, and what's the theory here? Because, you know, let's, let's also admit here that while Portland does have a significant um, minority community of, of black and brown people, of native uh, people, um, Asian uh, Americans, they, uh, this I think is seen, I think, and I'm just speaking demographics here, as one of the, if not the whitest large city yes. uh, in America, or, or as I like to say, the, the whitest NBA city in the country, in the country, no offense again to the people of Portland. Uh, you were born the way you were born. Um, nonetheless, what's been so impressive is how many white people have been willing to put themselves on the line, risk their lives and keep this thing going now for two months, for yeah. two months. Um, what, what is the, Help us out here because I I agree with you. If they can get away with this, you know whatever what you said there, and what I said about it being um, spring training, that if they can get away with it in Portland, they can get away with it in Albuquerque. That's my point. If they can get away with it there, they can get away with it in Boise. They can get away with yep. it just about any place else. So they've got to beat down the city of resistance first. Yeah, I think there's a particular series of events that has caused this current situation to happen. Um, the first thing is, I don't say like um, the pandemic actually is one of the main things that has kept this going is because a lot of people in Portland are out of work. A lot of people are out of jobs um, and they, and they're, you know, they're frustrated at certain things and they have nothing else to do. So like, we may as well go and protest the police. Um, other thing is like protesting is like a big part of portland's culture here this is like it's like a key tenant of the city is to protest like when you're talking about like the white supremacists and stuff yeah they, they they all come here because portland is such a protest city that they know that they'll be able to in, like incite a, a reaction from people right so port protesting itself is just a big part of like this city's culture um so that um so yeah the p pandemic protesting the extreme brutality by the police has caused a lot of people to get really frustrated and show up in bigger numbers and then now the federal presence has caused the uh protests to balloon in size i know like trump said he sent them in here to quell the protests and they're being quelled um th the week before f federal troops were here we were maybe getting like 500 people on a good night um for the past week we've been getting one to five thousand people every night 
um, usually more around like around like, around like three thousand people in the streets. So I wouldn't necessarily call that quelled. Um, so there's been just so many things that have just like led to these to continue to move on because people are out of work. Unemployment is starting to run out. Um, there's a lot of people offering free food here at the protest. We have this like makeshift kitchen set up called Riot Ribs where they just, they, it's just these people that it's hard to just give out free food. Um, they have, you know, there's, there's people offering like m- medical supplies here. One of, one of, uh, organs like, um, hospitals, um, it's called like, a uh, organs it's OSHU. I, f- I forget what it stands for, but it's like one of like organs, like state hospitals that connected to like the university. Um, they, they, they always have like a table here, uh, giving out like masks, you know, first aid, um, so there's just so many things that are like when you're here, you're in a supportive community, you're getting free food, you're around people trying to keep you safe, and you're offering some kind of resistance to these people that have been beating up your friends and you for like months on end. And now, you know, once people have like a mission of like trying to like stop this like proto fascism from taking root in Portland, P- Portland's gonna Portland's gonna keep Portland's gonna stay here until the feds are gone, and e- even when the feds are gone. They're going to stay here until the police is gone. Um, I, I don't see this ending anytime soon. I, I see this only picking up steam so far. What can we do to help? We, the rest of the country, because I think now it's dawned on many people, if not most, that you do need to succeed. You in Portland. Um, and we're not in Portland. And some of us are 3,000 miles away. But it seems like we've got to do something to help you, to support you. Um, like right away, I just want to go online and get 10 bulletproof vests for you and your, your friends, because, you know, and I, oh, it's such a, it's such a, a dark thought, but I, well, I no, but yeah, honestly, but no, but yes. And, and, um, and let me tell you, having been in situations like this, remember when you're wearing it to not let your defense down thinking that you're now I'm safe. It's, oh yeah, no, uh, you're, you're, you might be even in more danger when they see you wearing that. Uh, they'll be yeah. very, very offended that you dare to, uh, uh, to want to live. Um, but what can we do? What can the people listening to this? Cause you've got, uh, tens of thousands, if not eventually this week, hundreds of thousands of people listening to this podcast. And here's a direct line to you, Garrison Davis, 17 years old in Portland. What can we do to help you and your friends who are leading one of the most important moments of resistance in, in at least my lifetime, if not, certainly one of the top moments in our history. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that can really be done. Um, the Portland, uh, the, uh, PTX, the PDX protest bail fund, which is helping people that are, you know, with, uh, with legal fees and getting and helping people get, um, out, like, uh, out of jail. Um, that's, you know, one of the more basic things to do. Um, supporting how do we, how local, do we, how do we can, where, do, where do we go to contribute to that bail fund? Cause you get arrested then you're in jail and, uh, you got to get out of jail. Um, so what's the, what, what is the way it, by the way, for people listening, PDX is the three letter airport code for Portland. So if you've ever flown to Portland, your ticket will say like JFK to PDX, PDX. Yeah. Is Portland. Uh, yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a GoFundMe called the PDX protest bail fund that, uh, that you can go to. Um, but on, honestly, right now, because we're dealing with so much Fed stuff, that's that's not really as applicable at the moment because the police aren't arresting people at the same rate. It's been mainly, mainly, mainly the Feds. Now, what can we do right now? Do some of us need to come to Portland? I mean, what? You no. Know? Well, it depends. If you're coming here to protest, you can you, you can get here safely. Feel free to join the fight. Um, what you can do is you can support all the local journalists that have been here since day one reporting on this stuff. And you can encourage news to like news media to not send their own crews down here that don't understand what's happening in portland they aren't familiar with like the protesters in portland they aren't familiar with tactics they aren't familiar with like this train of events um and what they can do instead is get these big news organizations to contact all of the local journalists that actually have been doing the work and have like laid the basis of all of the reporting that's been happening the past month um so the, and thankfully that has that has been happening more. I mean, we, we definitely do have a few crews that have been parachuted in that really don't know any have they, they don't have any idea of what's happening. Um, but there's also been a lot of a lot of news media that has been contacting all all the local journalists to really figure out, you know, how this has happened, why this has happened, what the train of events is. So that's the other thing you can do. Um, yeah, uh, uh, so you can 
Um, you can mostly journalists how, how here. You support, can. How do we support the local on the yeah. ground journalists? And I'm, we're talking internet journalists too. Yeah, uh, most of us on Twitter will have like a cash apps or PayPal's. There's like a there's like a Google Doc that you can uh, that that is circulated around pretty re- uh, pretty often. If you search like local Portland journalists um, on Twitter, you'll 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 find it eventually. Um, but yeah, like, like all of the local people here, like I can I can try to um, pull up just like a, a big list of all of the people that have been just been have really have done the basis of all of all of the reporting for the past, the, the past two months. Yeah. Because the local, like you say, when the, when the uh, national uh, media parachutes in the, the stories I've seen on TV are pretty pathetic about Portland. They don't really uh, capture what's going on. And um, uh, they're, you know, they still are in that mentality they've been in since the uh, illegal invasion of Iraq, where we've got to support the troops. And so they don't, they don't want to get too gnarly against the men in camouflage. And it's it, the bias is very evident uh, to me. And, and I think if they, if somebody would go there and just spend a day or two or three with those of you who are in this, the citizens talking yeah. about, not the secret police, but the citizens, they would see what's happening and they would see why you're out there and, and they would see the diversity of of the people that are there, even though it's led mostly by young people, you have all ages, you have all races. Uh, you, you, it's it's um, it's an amazing thing, and it's something that I think a lot of cities, a lot of smaller towns, could emulate um, by by studying you know what you've done. But to study it, we've got to see the real deal. And I've only yeah. been getting it in a lar- in large part from you and your friends. So I'm yes. I'm being told the truth. Not by people who have been educated and gotten degrees uh, from major universities uh, to be on national TV, but I'm I'm getting it from youngsters essentially in, in Portland. Um, I'm getting much more truth about what's happening, and I would suggest to anybody who is in the mainstream media listening to this, you're missing an historic event. It's this is when you need to send your anchor there for the day and the night and report from Portland, you know, don't, don't wait till somebody's killed. Do it now because it's, it's exhilarating to see a citizens uh, um, uprising. That's nonviolent. When I say nonviolent, nonviolent against people. Against people. Yeah. Um, Buildings can't experience violence. Buildings cannot experience violence, but as we know, our constitution and our economic system are set up to protect property and wealth. Yes. All of that. So, um, and that's why I don't want anybody to be in jail. That's why we've set up our own GoFundMe legal defense fund for people. that, are, If you're taking down a statue, I guess legally I cannot tell you, please go take down that statue and then I will give you money from the defense fund. So I'm not saying that. Um, but I am saying I don't want you to spend a more than a single night years in jail. In jail. Yeah. Yes. And not 10 years in prison, uh, which is what Trump wants to do to you. So we're going to, we're going to defeat this bastard one way or the other. And I can see now this is, he knows his history. He's not as stupid as we think he is. He knows that, for instance, we've never removed a president ever during a time of war. Yep. He was trying to call this a war. First, there was the war on the coronavirus. He lost that war, hugely defeated uh, by that. And so now it's a, it's a war against the anarchists, what he calls the radical left, um, the, the uh, uh, what is it, and, and, Antifa, Antifa? Antifa, yeah. And what is it, Antifa? Yes. Uh, in fact, I even saw on one of your sites, uh, some of you were so happy to see the moms showed up. You dubbed them the, the mom Tifa. <laughs> what? One of them had a sign that said, Mom Tifa is here. So yeah, I, I, I posted that around. Oh. <laughs> yes, that was, uh, but, but it's like, this is our moment and, and, and we're not, we're not in Portland physically, but, but you need to know the eyes of the nation are on you. You need to know that we are going to support you and back you in whatever way we can. And we are going to do the same thing in our towns and cities. We, yeah, and, 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 and every town, I mean, where I, where I live in, I live in uh, Traverse city, Michigan. It's a town of 15,000 people. Who live there year round, 
15,000 people way up, way up on Lake Michigan. And, uh, and they, they had a black lives matter, uh, uh, support protest, uh, a week or so after George Floyd was murdered, 15,000 people in this city. And I don't, I, I would be hard pressed to, to find 10 black families. It's way up in rural Northern Michigan. And yet there were 2000 people at the demonstration. It was amazing. And I, you know, you start to have these glimmers of hope. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we're going to come out of this. Okay. And, and it, it just, um, and I think everybody listening to this, no matter what size of town you're in, in Portland, we call Portland a large city, but of the large cities, it's not, it's not a huge, it's a smaller, large city. Yeah. It's a small, large city, but it's a, it's an important city, but it's, but if they can do it there, we should be doing it wherever we are, but it will take risk. It will take risk. You are risking yourself, Garrison, every single night. Um, now, thankfully, I've teamed up with a few other like really great journalists that like, you know help me stay safe. Uh, there's a journalist named um, R- Robert Evans that has that has a few popular podcasts. He's been down here doing reporting. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've, I've 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 been with him. There's a there's there's a the Portland journalism community has really united, and we're all kind of family now. It's been really awesome to see. Uh, we're, we're all, you know, we have so many in jokes in our group chats. We're so supportive. We're talking about how we're all going to set up therapy for when this is all over to, to help with our PTSD. Um, so that, that, that's really been the one thing that like keeps the journalists out here is the community we've built or else we would just be also exhausted and just like, like ruined mentally. Um, so if yeah, that, that's why I think like, if you can support the local journalists, they're the, really the ones that have kind of, they're the ones that, you know, told America about what's happening. Um, and, you know, if, if Portland wins, they, the Portland journalists here are very much responsible for not having a police state take over Portland uh, because of just the fantastic work that my, my colleagues and I have been, well, I, I don't want to like praise myself, but like, like my colleagues who are also out here every night as, 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 as well as me, um, just filming all of this, you know, in the crossfires, like I've only been shot like, twice badly with rubber bullets there's been journalists arrested and charged with felonies for doing nothing more than just filming there's been journalists beaten to a bloody pulp there's been journalists that have have had their ribs broken right so there's there's been there's been so much worse things have happened to 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 other people besides myself um so yeah if you look up um portland independent journalists spreadsheet on twitter that, that, that phrase portland independent journalist spreadsheet it'll bring up a google doc of all of the people doing all this fantastic work wow. um some of us are some of us are freelance um some of us work for uh work for some like a uh, news organizations every once in a while there's a local uh newspaper in portland called the portland mercury that absolutely support them they've been doing the best written coverage out of any place i've seen um, the Portland Mercury is just in, a phenomenal um, news outlet here, uh, here based in Portland. They've been doing just amazing work, along with you know, and then along with like a dozen independent people. You know, we've ever we have people here that have you know freelance for the New York Times. I've been sending a lot of footage to NBC. Um, we have you know LA Times, Washington Post. We've had a lot of we've had a lot of these people are starting to work with these bigger news organizations now, which is great that their work is finally getting recognized. Um, but yeah, you, you can support them. You can support them on Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, because they absolutely deserve it. They have been getting beaten up and put in like put in between protesters and bullets for months now. Um, and yeah, they, they deserve all the support that they can have. Well, I'll do my part in, uh, in being supportive in that way. And uh, I will make sure that your voice and the voices of those you're working with are amplified on my Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram and on this podcast. Um, I, um, I, I really admire you and, uh, um, I just feel so much better about the world I'm living in knowing that there's people like you, Garrison, and 17 year olds like you who are, are doing this. And, uh, and it's exciting to think about what you will do, um, as you grow older, as you become an adult, uh, it, it, we need you. Uh, I'm sorry. We left, you know, we, we didn't fix everything. And, and in fact, in many ways, the world is worse off than when we were your age. And it's, um, it should have been that way. And so sadly you have to, you and your generation have to now make this work. Um, because, um, because we, we did our best and we did a lot of good things, but, um, but we're not over yet either. And so, so we can follow you 
and 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 we can help you. Um, and I think we all all need to do that. And it, uh, I don't know if you're going to make a film about uh, with all the stuff you've been filming and whatever, but uh, whatever you do with it, do something. Let let the people see. Let them know what happened in Portland. This this moment um, must be remembered uh, for decades to come. And uh, and you're going to be a very important person in making sure that that, that happens. And I can't I can't thank you enough. And um, are you are you going back out there tonight? And uh, uh, what's your what's your plan in the next couple of days here? Yeah, I'm I'm planning on going out there tonight. Um, my 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 leg is fine that I can still. I can still run away from the feds if they uh, if they try to chase me down, um, and yeah, I'll be out here. You know, the weekend there's 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 a lot of actions planned on the weekend. I believe there. Um, I just heard an announcement that this Friday there are a few groups planning a dodgeball fight, um, bringing a whole bunch of dodgeballs to uh, in front of in front of the federal courthouse and trying to get the feds to well. I, I don't know what exactly their plan is. I'm, yeah. I'm not quite sure yet, but I've, I've heard there's going to be dodge brawls bought, uh, brought to the federal courthouse. And that's kind of all I know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's more long, to speculate. <laughs> my, my assumption would be uh, the idea is to play dodgeball, not war. Uh, yeah. Well, and you know, I, I, I doubt the federal officers will throw dodgeballs back. I think they're probably going to throw tear gas back, but I think it'll be, a, it'll be very interesting to film to see a whole bunch of teenagers throwing dodgeballs at the police or at the, at the feds and feds responding with, you know, rubber bullets and uh, tear gas. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. That's what I'm hearing is going to happen Friday. Uh, but there's actions planned all weekend. You know, there's, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of moms and dads all showing up every night, like color, color coordinated. Um, yeah. It's like the stuff, the stuff's not dying down. And as, as, as long as it's happening, I'll, I'll be out there. Well, thank you for that. Please be careful. I, I know the dodgeball. It's a great idea, and it's very funny. Um, and you do want to see what the, what will happen. But we, we don't want to see that violence, obviously, being perpetrated against you and your friends and your fellow resistors. So please, please, please be careful. Um, we will all do what we can to support you. Uh, everyone's eyes now, are, I think, are wide open to this. And... Um, and that's, I wanted to get this emergency podcast uh, of Rumble out now uh, so that because I worry about the coming weekend and, um, and we need to put Trump and the federal government and whatever authorities in Portland um, are cooperating and collaborating, we need to put them all on notice that uh, they're not going to get away with any of this. And, um, you know, I, and I, I loved you tell, saying that the reason, one of the reasons why people are free actually have the freedom to protest, which we should always feel that is that they've been laid off that Trump Trump's bungling of the, of the pandemic, his total lack of leadership and allowing tens of thousands of people to die that didn't need to die. That his, his, his bungling of this has created tens of millions of unemployed people who really now have nothing better to do than bring him down. So, that I hope history will record it that way because it's it looks like he um he really fucked up. Garrison, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Uh and I know we've we've been kind of laughing a little bit, but I think it's only out of out of real nervousness and concern. It's coping. And, yeah, and, it's coping. Yeah, we're just coping. So people listening to this saying, what are these two joking around about? We're not joking, folks. We're deadly serious. We just don't want to die. And we don't want yes. anybody to die. So um so we have to win this. This must be a win. And it's not an if Portland wins. It's just when. And the sooner, the better. Uh, so that they will not send the Trump troops uh, to these other cities. It will be a worthless endeavor. Um, so, Garrison, um, you probably got to get going uh, uh, here uh, off to wherever you're headed. Please stay safe. Please keep sending us uh, photos and video um uh his handle once again is at hungry bow tie uh at hungry bow tie garrison davis and um and look for the what's it called again the the portland uh, independent journalist spreadsheet you can look that up it'll have a, a giant list of all the people doing just fantastic reporting all right and i'll i'll put these links here on my podcast page too in case uh nobody had a, if you didn't have a chance to write it down um be safe garrison yeah uh, we want we want to talk to you again okay yeah, absolutely. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much.
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Okay, be well. And that was Garrison Davis, a 17-year-old from Portland, Oregon, on the front lines, risking his life every single night. God, God speed to him, take care of him, protect him, and all the others out there. It's an amazing group of young people, of women. Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, I'm and on our episode tomorrow, uh, we will have uh, one of the women uh, that's been on those front lines uh, with us. So please come back to us tomorrow uh, for the uh, next part in this series of emergency podcasts uh, regarding the situation in Portland. Um, thank you for listening today. Get the word out. And don't forget uh, to uh, contribute to the Rumble Legal Defense Fund for these warriors for democracy who are out there in the streets for us. Um, I want to make sure that uh, they get the help they need. And we will do that through this Legal Defense Fund. 100% of all money donated uh, goes to the people um, who are being abused uh, by Trump and his uh, regime. Whatever you give is going to go to the young people, the women, people of color, and others who are fighting there, not just in Portland, but across the country. Thanks for tuning in uh, to this uh, special episode uh, of our emergency podcast system here on Rumble with Michael Moore. I'm Michael Moore. Let's get busy. Let's get busy.